another state I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate Seem like my homies were stuck in the hood I just told them be safe in the state all right, welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. I am your host, Too Black. We have the family back for the most part today. Um, no guests. Uh, what up, everybody? What up, what up? Hey. Yo, what's good? What up? So we got Ryan, whose mic is got his own life going on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, got, we got Terrell, who's always live with, you know, the vices. Libations. <laughs> Donations, donations, and then we got um, we got Cam. What up? what up? Hey, hey. All right. Uh, so um, today we are um, honoring the um, the hundred hundred year um, anniversary commemoration of uh, the Tulsa massacre, and we're doing that by uh, dealing with some of the myths surrounding it, uh, specifically the myth that it was self-sustaining. So the myth is that uh, Black Wall Street specifically Black Wall Street, was self-sustaining. As an economy, um, there's, there's been a large narrative pushed forward to try to tell us that, um, you know, it was this wonderful Black community that had all these businesses. And it's, some of this is true, but uh, there's also, like, another undergirding that I think needs to be covered. Um, so, like, I'm just curious what some of y'all have heard about Black Wall Street, because I know for me, it seems like the information is different with every article. Uh, me and Cam did the whole fun thing yesterday. Uh, <laughs> Just trying to trying to track some information. I might actually now nah, I'm gonna do that on part two. But um, it was just interesting. We we eventually could not find where this information came from. So I'm just curious what some what some what some things y'all heard about Black Wall Street and the massacre, and it all just kind of gets collapsed. Just anybody can go on that. Anything that I've heard about Black Wall Street has always been like it's the black utopia, something to aspire to. That's all I've ever um, heard about Black Wall Street. Um, people always talk about how like Black Wall Street was essentially Oz with like streets paved of gold and there's the infamous quotes that you know the black dollar circulated like 50 times before mm -hmm. ever even leaving the community and there it was filled with more millionaires than anywhere else in America that were all black and um, just made it seem like it was just a blissful bustling city instead of a community full of rich black folks living their best ass lives which i wish was true um but that's not 100 percent factual and so i'm glad that we're going to talk about it because if we're going to honor them and give them the the flowers that they do deserve for what they were able to build we also have to do so by telling the truth and bringing the nuance into that exactly yeah yeah exactly so I've heard a combination of both my whole, my, uh, I guess my words for it was like a black utopia. Like we were just, I don't want to use the comparison to Wakanda, but that's it's already been word. done. It's already been done. So go that's ahead. That's why I didn't want to say it. It's already been done on the Tulsa um, Cultural Center site or something of that nature. So mm -hmm. rebuilding Wakanda, I think is what it said. I'll, the screenshot will be a um, appearing on your screen if you're watching this live, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so anything else, Terrell? I'm sorry. No, nah, no, nah, that's it's just the stuff you hear. Like when you hear it, you're like, oh snap! Well, I see why they did what they did to it, and this. So believe you, you tend to believe it, but then when you start to really listen to it and hear, it, like you start piecing stuff together, like uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's just a little exaggerated. So yeah, and and and, and again, when we say self-sustaining, um, there this is not something we pulled from nowhere. Like this is what gets said. Uh, this is for the people who are watching this on Black Power Media. I'm going to show you for the folks listening to this. You can you can just I'll just read it to you. But in a CNBC article, um, we see here it's uh, right here. It says. Nearly a hundred, nearly a century ago, thousands of Black Tulsa, uh, uh, Black Tulsa, Oklahoma residents had built a self-sustaining community that supported hundreds of Black-owned businesses. Now, when I looked it up, there was actually 191 Black businesses, but I've seen numbers as high as 2,000, sometimes, um, sometimes 600, um, and it just seems like I don't really know a lot of times where people are getting their numbers from. Um, and this was not just this article. If you Google Black Wall Street self-sustaining, you'll find several articles. You'll find JSTOR, 
um, you'll find um, black newspapers that all use this term self-sustaining. So we're going to just get into that. Like what does self-sustaining even mean? Like some of the backdrop of um, this history. And then we're going to give you some context um, before we get to the actual day of the riot. And a riot, I don't even think it's accurate or of the massacre. And then we're going to go from there. All right, so yeah, quick breakdown, just what happened uh, specifically, like a quick breakdown before I read the everything else. So 300 people died or were killed, mainly black people. Um, this was this is this about 16 hour event between May 31st, 1921 and um, June 1st, 1921. Um, over uh, 1200, uh, 1,256 homes were burned down, 191 black businesses, um, including theaters, libraries, um, they did not, I don't believe they actually burned down the schools, but salons, um, doctor's offices, barber shops, all these things were taken out. Uh, and, and that's kind of the popular narrative that we're talking about. Um, and there's probably more than 300 people dead because there are mass graves that have been yet to be completely investigated, but they have found here recently that there's a certain level of weight under the ground that, that tells that there might be more people. Um, so that's something to look out for. Now, before I start reading, I do want to show the people who are watching this a map and describe it to the people who are listening. I want to show people the and describe the district of Greenwood, the neighborhood that Black Wall Street existed within. This is the area that was destroyed, and we're going to get to more maps later. But for those who are listening or watching, this is the area that was destroyed. It's about 35 blocks of an entire neighborhood. The Black Business District known now as Black Wall Street, which was not the title of this area at the time. It was referred to disparagingly by white folks as Little Africa. Um, some people called it Negro Wall Street, particularly Booker T. Washington. Black Wall Street is more of a posthumous name that came after this area was destroyed. Um, but this is the area. And for those who are watching, it is a about three blocks. You'll see there in pink. For those listening, it's about a three block area in the south side of the Greenwood neighborhood. And then surrounding it is the churches and the newspaper, the black newspaper and such and such. But it was not a huge area um, that that expanded to the extent that the actual Wall Street does or anything of that nature. I just want to clarify that because, again, like we said at the beginning, sometimes there's this mystification that happens. And then the folklore, a narrative starts to begin about what this was versus what it actually is. The folklore of Black Wall Street has been used to shame Black people, particularly poor ones, as brainwashed as a brainwashed group of disunified, lazy spenders who rather frivolously buy Jordans and have babies that they can't afford and support Black economic independence. This propaganda shields the myth of Black capitalism and places the blame on a dysfunctional Black behavior as opposed to capitalism. One needs to look no further than the promotion of financial literacy programs and buy Black campaigns as solvents to our oppression. Therefore, we feel it's time to bust the myth of Black Wall Street's self-sustainability because it's attached to so many other harmful ideas. Now, as it was already stated, Black Wall Street is a product of segregation. As historian Hannibal Johnson said about Black Wall Street, the author of the Black Wall Street from riots, renaissance and Tulsa's historic Greenwood district, it was an economy born of necessity. It, would have, it wouldn't have existed had it not been for Jim Crow segregation and the inability of Black folks to participate in a substantial degree in in a larger white dominated economy. In other words, Black Wall Street didn't happen in a bubble. It's imperative to see segregation as more than just laws that dictates what neighborhood we can live in or where we're allowed to eat. Segregation is an intentional public policy made to allocate labor, resources, and space for the benefit of the white supremacist state. The state, not simply as a government, but what a friend of the show, Rasul, defines as the combined authority of the government, the bureaucracies, corporate control, and private interests. Black Wall Street could not have existed outside of the authority of the state because Jim Crow was what authorized it. There is no self-sustainability under racial apartheid, only survival. To provide a simple definition of self-sustaining when individual group or individual is able to exist with no outside help. To think of this, think of this as like if this was your home. If it was your home, it means you, are, you own your land, you can grow all the food you need on your land, you have all the resources, whether that be wood, clothing, tools, et cetera, necessary to sustain yourself within your own space without assistance from anyone else or very limited assistance. It also means you have the ability to defend yourself if someone comes to your home and tries to take that shit from you. 
In a capitalist economy, this level of, of self-sustainability is virtually impossible unless you live off the grid in some form, whether that be a maroon society or a commune, or even Wakanda, a fictional place. Now you may say we're being too literal. Man, we know Black Wall Street wasn't Wakanda, but it still was economic independence. To this I say that even if we were to loosen the definition of self-sustainability, which we really shouldn't, the facts still just don't bear out anything resembling independence. Most of the black people in Greenwood were not prospering. According to the Oklahoma Commission study on the Tulsa race riot, despite the growing fame of its commercial district, the vast majority of Greenwood's adults were neither businessmen nor businesswomen, but worked long hours under trying conditions for white employers, for white employers, emphasis added, largely barred from employment in both the oil industry and for most of Tulsa's manufacturing facilities. These men and women toiled at a difficulty of 10 dirty, generally menial jobs that the kinds that most whites consider beneath them as, dan as janitors and ditch diggers, dishwashers, maids, porters, day laborers, domestics, and service workers. In sum, it's largely forgotten that it was nevertheless their paychecks that built Greenwood and their hard work that helped build Tulsa. This means that it was mainly the product of poor black labor earned from white bosses that sustained the prestigious black district now known as Black Wall Street. The money was not self-contained and most people were struggling to get by. Now to just jump in, we're not knocking any of these people from this time, this is no disrespect to them, but like Cameron said earlier, we need to tell the truth. We don't need to perpetuate this idea that everybody was balling. Um, now the money was, again, the money was not self-contained and as a result of this poverty, 95% of the Negro residents in the Black Belt lived in poorly constructed frame houses without conveniences. This is again, according to the report and on streets which were pay unpaved in which the drained age was all surface. Um, and the report listed a reference inside of it um, from the American Association of Social Workers who did an analysis of the neighborhoods at this time. Um, some may say, well, the dollar circulated 33 times or whatever, like Cameron said, but there's, like, there's no evidence for that. And we'll deal with that in the second episode. However, we shouldn't use this tragedy occurred to promote a fantasy that never happened like Killer Mike is doing with this Greenwood app, trying to promote this idea of black capitalism. This brings us to the final point, the violence. Now, I would argue that one of the reasons the Tulsa massacre gets so much attention is not mainly just because of the violence, but because of what the violence destroyed. Just two years prior to the Tulsa massacre, 237 black people were massacred in Elaine, Arkansas. I believe this story does not receive as much attention, partially because those murdered were just farmers and sharecroppers. They're not perceived as businessmen like the residents of Tulsa. That story doesn't represent the same class agenda. The class agenda likes to paint the violence that transpired in Tulsa as a disruptor to an otherwise glorious black success story as opposed to an inevitable outcome of racial capitalism, i.e. capitalism. But violence is to capitalism as money is to banking, hence the term blood money. There is no Tulsa without violence. There is no Oklahoma without violence. And there is certainly no America without violence. We cannot continue to dismiss the violence as something from the outside as of an otherwise promising system or this American dream. So today for part one of this series, we're going to cover the violence, not only the violence of the riot, but the violence that precipitated it. And if we can understand the violence, we can understand why there is no self-sustainability self without self-defense. We have to understand the context in which the violence evolved and how this is, is just concrete to the, to the system as anything else. And you can't separate it and try to just cherry pick history. All right, so yeah, as we pointed out, we're not gonna, make, we're not gonna discuss the economy for the most part any further in any, in any large sense, but I hope it was established that Tulsa, it was not this necessarily black utopia. Now, again, people did well for the time they lived in. Um, it's great that some people were able to come up um, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the black folks that, you know, um, Gurley who came there and helped fought 40 acres and gave loans to black businesses, black business owners was obviously thinking in a, in a rather cooperative sense, but this was not a place where they didn't have to deal with the outside world. That's just, that's what self-sustaining actually means um, is you don't have to deal with the outside world because you have everything you need. And even again, even if we were to loosen that definition up, it still doesn't work because most of the people went to work like black people anywhere else during that time, you know? So. Yeah. yeah, they make a living. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're gonna just go over some history to understand like how, how did Tulsa come to be? How did we get to the moment um, and what, and some of the things that preceded it 
and how violence is just runs throughout this whole history. Um, so Oklahoma um, was first, was I don't want to say first, Oklahoma, the land of what we call Oklahoma has been there forever. Uh, mm -hmm. But one of the, one of the more um, prominent eras of what was pre Oklahoma is the, is the trail of tears. Um, and this is what native Americans were forced. Uh, I don't know if it's like saying native Americans, native people were forced off of their land. And this is where they were forced to. There was also some black folks, some of them slaves involved in these trail of tears. And it was five tribes, primarily um, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, the uh, Chick Chickasaw and the Seminole all marched um, out of their ancestral lands to Indian territory or what we call present day Oklahoma. So this was, they were forced there so white settlers could take up the land where they previously lived. This is, this is how this starts. Um, now, as time goes on, you know, obviously these people die and they get chicken pox and there's some of them just flat out murdered on this road, on this road there. But as time goes on, as we'll, we'll see, eventually they're kicked out of Oklahoma <laughs> so they can continue to establish another white settler territory. But before that, post the Civil War, um, there was an attempt to make um, Oklahoma an all black state. You know, mm -hmm. this is something that gets left out of history uh, often. And there was a brother by the name of uh, E.P. McCabe who um, pushed federal legislation. Um, he was a former state auditor of Kansas. This was a black man. And he asked Congress to designate Oklahoma as a black state. Um, McCabe's push was what was called a Negro colonization. And it got as far as a congressional committee but it was obviously shut down and eventually his life was threatened um, but for trying to do this. But there are actually a lot of, um, to the, I don't know, to this day, a lot of them have been gone, but at one point there were, there were several all black towns in Oklahoma. But again, this was not actually the state of Oklahoma at the time. It was just the area that we wouldn't understand as Oklahoma. Um, so this idea of like a black hub or even the whole quote unquote Mecca I wonder why people don't tip point at this more sometimes because this was a goal to actually establish an entire state uh, uh, for black people. Yeah, uh, it was like for almost 60 years that what is now Oklahoma functioned as primarily what would have been a completely black state. Yeah, and natives. Yeah. So it's like this is before white folks wanted Oklahoma. Um, so they were somewhere else. But once white folks said they wanted, it, then things started to change up. Um, so the state is founded as a state within the Union of the United States in um, 1907. Um, and you know, the first law that they pass um, when they founded it as a state is called Senate Bill 1. And that was a segregation bill. The very first law they passed when the state was founded was a segregation bill, um, barring people from rail cars and waiting facilities. So white folks immediately put their stamp on the state that this, this, is, this is ours. Um, but at the time, you know, we we hear a lot. We're hearing nowadays about certain types of um, unity across ethnic lines, but at the time, mm -hmm. black and red people were trying to work something out. And there's another story. I didn't put this in my notes. Um, I cannot remember the name of the of the um, re of the rebellion at the time. I looked this up, but there was a rebellion um, by a group of socialists um, in in the early 1900s um, in Oklahoma. That, that tried to overthrow the state and make it, and it was, it was white folks, black people and natives. Um, and they tried to make it their own state that failed. And, and from some things that I read, a, a red flag is still banned in Oklahoma uh, because that's oh, wow. a socialist flag. Um, we talked a little bit about this on our, uh, on our, we're not our ancestors episode. Um, so, so again, a bit of history, I'll look it up later. That's just left, that's just left out of, out of the narrative. Um, but there was a strong socialist presence in Oklahoma, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit later. Um, so this is, again, the state's founded in 1907. This is ironically around the time that the NAACP is founded. The NAACP is founded in response to a series of race riots that are happening in the early 1900s, um, you know, coming out of the Niagara movement. Um, and this is also getting inching towards the time where there was a second wave of the Klan. Now, a lot of times we just think of the Klan as the Klan, but like the second wave of the Klan is a, little, is a lot different than the first wave and even, you know, the waves that, that um, uh, preceded. <clears throat> so the first wave of the Klan, um, to take from, to just read some of our sources, it, it was in its uh, second resurgence, the Klan moved beyond just targeting Blacks 
and broaden its message to, to hate and for the hate to include Catholics, Jews, and foreigners. The Klan promoted fundamentalism and devout patriotism along with advocating white supremacy. They blasted bootleggers, motion pictures, and espoused a return to clean living, appealing to folks uncomfortable with a shifting nature of America from rural agricultural society to an urban industrial nation. The Klan attacked the elite urbanites and intellectuals. So this Klan's motivation was not just, let's just kill niggers. Like, more so the first wave, that was pretty much all they were trying to do. Like they didn't really have any other interests. It was like right after slavery. Um, this, this one was trying to more so restore a certain type of order. And obviously black people are never, never fit the order. Um, so black people were a major part of this, but this is also other groups of people that they felt were distorting order. And this is at a time when urbanization is starting to happen. More people are coming into this country. Um, there is a transition from rural to uh, more cities. So you have more, you have crime on the rise and the Klan is there to kind of corral this. Is this something you're gonna say, Cameron? The Klan was just, and is still just a bunch of bitches. Like, and it's just a continuation of people. I think it's so ironic that like, segregation was all about wanting nothing to do with black folks but then when black folks were like we don't want to fuck with you either they're like matter of fact we don't like that either so now we're coming for everybody yeah because they're they're there to <laughs> stop the spread of the unclean life whether that's and this is also around the time of prohibition you know this is a lot of prostitution going on which we'll get to more so specifically to tulsa but the clan was like where the where where we're like the unofficial police, which is a lot different from the way that white supremacists think today, because they uh, they think that the state has failed them, and it's their job to overthrow it. The Klan actually felt mm -hmm. that they were the state, and it was their job to represent it. Um, so just just to give a little bit of a difference, um, they barely brushed their teeth, and they wanted a clean state. Ironic. Hey, Wait, and, and these these yeah. people were in politics, particularly here in Indiana. Uh, they were, they were, uh, they were deep in politics. Um, they had influence with the mayor. They held certain seats. Uh, this was a, this was a strong resurgence, and it was largely promoted or, by the the film uh, Birth of a Nation, uh, yeah. which the president of the time, Woodrow Wilson, um, actually watched in the White House. Um, so again, just giving you context of like how violent and how crazy this time was. This is just that's 1915. The the massacre happens in. 1921 so this is basically like be like a day before right <laughs> like as far as it, within the line of history um and time moved much slower back then um than it does today um there was no social media obviously you know telegrams and all that shit um and this is after the massacre um but i think i just found this fact interesting the ku klux klan actually uses the massacre to grow in tulsa they didn't really exist much before the massacre um, but they use it as like propaganda machine. Um, but they bought a building in, in the time the Tulsa Klan grew so solvent that it built its own brick auditorium, um, be no hall, short as it was said for be no nigger, be no Jew, be no Catholic. And it was called be no hall. Um, so that that's again, this is what we were up against at the time. Um, so it also should give you more context as to why being self-sustaining was, was gonna be rough because you you have to you have to escape this. This is what you're up against. Um, so we can't pluck we can't pluck Tulsa out of out of all of this shit. Like this is this is what was going down. Um, Terrell, would you say something? No, I'm really just I'm really stuck on the fact. So you wanted segregation, complete separation, but mm -hmm. then you invade our spaces that, you know, not even our spaces, like you said, native people and whatever, you know, verbal contracts we had between them, whatever deals we had going on with them. And it's basically, it's, it's, it's segregation until we need your shit. Yeah. Then it's move the fuck out the way. Basically, well, it's, like, yeah. it's like when we need your shit, we're actually going to segregate you, right? So it's like, y'all are here in Oklahoma and we're not really here. And then there's an oil boom in Oklahoma, and that's really what brings more white people out is this oil boom. Yeah. That's where the jobs come from, right? So when they get to Oklahoma, it, that was like our oh, shit. Y'all live over there. Um, another thing at the time is is World War One, 
um, in World War One or just wars in general tend to escalate violence more because you got people coming home, you know, with PTSD. You got people coming home with all kinds of problems. And back then, I don't even think they had a term for PTSD. Uh, so, because again, this is World War One is uh was nineteen, I think 1914 and 1919, I believe. Um, and the United States got in, and I think it's 1917. Um, don't quote me on that. I could be a few years off on that. Um, but I believe they didn't get in. They weren't in the entirety of the war. But you got people coming home from war, um, which is a big recruitment for the Klan. Because these are people that have been trained in weaponry. These are people who are ready to go. And they're coming home and they want their shit because they felt like they felt they fought for their country and they shouldn't have to give it up to nobody else. Um, so you got Du Bois says um, in his essay at the time, um, what is the cause of all of this? And this is the essay called The Shape of Fear. He's talking about the Klan. Um, he said, what is the cause of all of this? There can be little doubt, but that the Klan in its present form is a legacy of, war, of the world war. Whatever there was of it before, that great catastrophe was negligible and of little moment. The wages of war is hate. And in the end, indeed, the beginning of hate is fear. The civilized world today and the world half civilized and uncivilized are desperately afraid. And he's referring to the Klan. So again, this is the world that these people are in this is before all this is before the massacre except for the Beano hill shit uh Beano hall shit like this is before the massacre um and then in, so, in oklahoma specifically um of uh, there were between 1907 and 1920 there were 33 lynchings that occurred in oklahoma um and 27 of those were black people because white folks you know it's not talked about because they don't like to talk about it but white folks actually did get lynched we're gonna get to that later too um but just similar to today, they don't like to talk about the violence that they do to each other because they don't talk about why I don't like crime, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so, so there's that. Uh, so we talked earlier about crime, right, and, and how the Klan is part of this, but the Klan is not the only one. All these kind of white vigilante groups are clashing. And remember, this is still the early 1900s, so everybody's not even really considered white yet. Like You still have people who are just considered ethnic groups, so like Catholics, are like almost an ethnic yeah. group, even though it's a religion. Same thing with Jewish people are really, you know, they're seen as uh, a whole nother ethnic group. You have the Irishmen. So there's, so everybody has, isn't like what we understand as white today. So there was a lot of fighting going on. Everybody didn't get along. Um, they still all, they all agreed they hated niggas. That was a consensus, consensus but, but they still, they still had wars amongst each other. They don't all get along today either, but I'm saying back then it was a different level. The violence, at least, uh, was a different level. So um, in Tulsa, there started being these stories, um, like say like 1917, 1918, even, even, even the year of 1921, earlier in the year, that um, you know there was all of this crime coming into the city. And I talked earlier about how there was um, urbanization so the city is growing, it's an oil boom, more people are moving in, it's constantly expanding. And some of the people who were there previously didn't like some of the folks coming in, because again, this is during prohibition, so there's no drinking. So, you know, it was a quote, um, done. it was a report done by a federal agent, a uh, report on the vice conditions in Tulsa. And it's like uh, gambling, bootlegging, prostitution are very much in evidence at the leading hotels the rooming housing, the bellhops, porters are pimping for women and also selling booze. Regarding the violation of law, these prostitutes have been solicited without any fear of the police as they will invariably remind you that they are in the safe of these houses. Uh, so you have all these folks who, you know, are like, well, you gotta worry about the crime, what's going on with the crime, like we gotta get the crime down. And initially in Tulsa, the records show it wasn't actually much of a complaint about like, Black people specifically, it was just like crime in general, they felt like was out of control. And the records show there was some issues of crime, whatever you want to call crime, right? Um, <clears throat> there were secret societies like um, the Knights of Liberty. Um, they, they, they were another pretty much white supremacist group, but they were not the Klan. So I'm saying there were all kinds of different groups at the time. Um, <clears throat> and they, they didn't just target black folks either, they target radicals they targeted a union and they beat the shit out of them. Um, so there's mm. also like this new growing anti-communism because remember the Bolshevik revolution in Russia is 1917. So all of this is happening at once, right? And and there's this, scare, there's this fear that, that, that communism and socialism is spreading throughout the world. And, you know, America has this deep hatred of those things. Um, so like, our, you know, our comrade on the channel, Dr. CBS talks about, there's a, 
there's always been this connection between like anti-radicalism and anti-blackness. Um, you really can't separate the two. Um, so anybody who breaks the social order in any real form is almost seen as like just some type of radical, even if it's just crime, but especially if it's any type of unions or anything of that nature. Um, I think one of the craziest stories I heard was even in Tulsa talking about the story of Roy Belton, um, a 19 years old. They said that he robbed and shot a cab driver. Mm -hmm. And then so two days after that, he's like being held in the jail of the Tulsa County Courthouse, changes his story about what happened and was like, I didn't do anything. But the taxi driver died and white people were in uproar. They were like, in fucking uproar about this and so literally like 11 o'clock that night you got hundreds of white folks who were outside the courthouse um essentially protesting and like yelling and telling them to like bring uh bring his ass out and so you know sheriffs of course in in records were like oh well we tried to hold back the mob very similar to the bullshit that happened at the capitol but as we saw live <laughs> they didn't do a damn thing they didn't do it now and they and this is a and this is a white yeah. boy this is a white boy this is like before we even get to what really happens as far as the massacre in greenwood um and they just let them, they let him in. They pulled his ass out and they were chanting, we got him, we got him. And mm -hmm. literally threw him in the taxi that they claimed he killed someone in um, and beat his ass. And then they lynched him. Like, and then in white newspapers, they called it a righteous protest. And, you know, they said that it was like a spirit in the act of uh, the Saturday mob that was coming to essentially um, purify from acts like this right and i thought that shit was wild and so it's like it's important to understand that they didn't give a damn about each other and was fighting each other tooth and nail um and there was just a continuation of this violence that was deep-seated amongst white people in tulsa and so before we even get to what transpired um and led to the massacre that took away lives of black folks uh that shit alone was wild to me yeah and the black people at the time um actually report uh, the, the the black newspaper wrote about it and and the, the brother that owned the black newspaper i think his name is uh smitherman he wrote about it and how like they saw like black people were like damn they're lynching them then it's it's curtains for us right <laughs> like yeah. just, like you you know, I mean, and it's still like that today. Like, you're like, all right, if white people are willing to do that to them, each other. Like, we need to just not come out the house, right? I'm just saying, like, that's that's what black people at the time really are thinking. Like, all right, they, they saw that more. Like, okay. And the police didn't really do anything. It was like, there wasn't even a lot of resistance. They let him pull him out the prison. I mean, that's, that's the crazy part. He got pulled out the prison or out the jail. They put him in the taxi, drove him out, interrogated him, and killed him. Right. Like, I think there was a brief moment where they like they thought the cops were coming. So they ran away and then they came back and, and actually finished the job. Like, that's the official story. Uh, but like, but like that's so I'm saying, imagine if you living right during that time. And it was another story where um, they tried to they tried to actually lynch a black. They thought a black man, though. This is the show. Black people were still resilient. Like this is like 1917 in Tulsa. They thought a black man was going to be lynched. And the brothers rolled down to the courthouse like, yo, you know, don't do it. Like, we, we, we got our guns. But they were like, we're, 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 you know, the police were like, nothing's really going to happen. And they so they actually prevented a lynching um, like previously. Uh, but then, you know, that was before they saw this white boy get lynched. That showed them that, OK, they're ready for a different level of violence. Right. Yeah. And what's crazy is even amongst all this shit that was happening and the fighting amongst um, white folks, of course, they had to come together on some bullshit and so then they started blaming black folks for all of the impurities that were taking mm -hmm. place during prohibition um even a former judge was interviewed in the paper and just told folks that black people are at the root of the problem it was black people's fault that you got white bootleggers making all this fucking moonshine and having the hotels filled and ran through with prostitutes and that's not to say that there weren't black pimps because there were niggas been pimping forever right. yeah, that, that but is what it is right. <laughs> but we weren't <laughs> it's not like we were at the forefront of prohibition and it um, doesn't mean anybody should be lynched 
and should exactly. yeah 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 you know, like that that's that's that up. so so that's that's just a little history of like what was going down before the massacre that's told like we said today we're mainly focusing on the violence so we'll deal with the economy more so and, and how it's you know pimped out you know no pun um to try to push a certain narrative today so so we're going to get into the massacre itself um as far as like what went down in more details because again just like we were saying with black wall street i didn't know i never really get a thorough understanding of like what really happened other than like a bunch of shit got burned down and they were trying to lynch somebody um so knowing even the stuff we'd already talked about like that there was this climate of we got to stop the crime and all that going on and they were willing to lynch their own um and you got people coming back from war and you have you have the rise of the clan um you have these other white vigilante groups you got you know you got all this going on and then on, on top of that there is this black city oh excuse me there is this black neighborhood um that that is existing um somewhat by itself obviously as we noted not not to the extent that it's often promoted but they did still have black businesses that where you didn't have to leave your neighborhood for everything like you still you could go to a grocery store you could go to a library you did have these things just again the mythology is that this was self-sustaining and as we see if you were self-sustaining that you would also be able to deal with this level of violence and and this is not a level of violence that anybody's set up to deal with if you're the minority in certain areas just not how this works um <clears throat> so yeah so this this is the stuff we're going to be quoting is primarily pulled um from from the um the Tulsa race riot commission report it was done in 2001 um this is after years of decades of of no one really talking about it and it and and being purposely suppressed they finally did a report and this report uh, as was quoted at, at the beginning when we talked about the living conditions of people gives us some insight more so into what went down um beyond just like kind of the vague notions of a riot so so it all starts um with a brother named uh, dick Rowland. Uh, he was 19 years old and um, he was a shoe shiner. He had dropped out of school actually to shoe shine, um, and he worked. He worked at a a white owned and white patronized shine parlor located downtown on the main street. Again, this is in Tulsa. So even right there, I just want to like freeze it. Like he's working for a white people, and I'm mm -hmm. not knocking him. But again, if 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 I believe the narrative that was sold to me about Black Wall Street, I don't. Why nobody worked for white people because we had our exactly. own shit. You know, so he's working for white people. I just want to highlight that. Again, no disrespect to him, but just this doesn't really get clarified in, in a lot right. of these large, larger told storylines. Yeah, um, and yeah. not necessarily him. It's just we're, we're right. pinpointing the narrative, like you said. Right. Like you said earlier, it's still people going out to these white uh, businesses <clears throat> to earn money to bring back to the community. And that's, that's basically what he was doing. Yeah. And, and just, I think it's a bigger point is just showing like the overall argument really like labor and wealth is produced by workers, not mm -hmm. owners. Right. Um, so, so even black wall street, the, whatever, uh, whatever heights it reached was actually, even the, 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 the report itself says was really, it was produced by the workers who went to work, got paid, whatever little they got. And then they spent their money in these, in these businesses and they wouldn't have spent it there if there wasn't segregation. So, None of that self-sustaining. But anyway, um, so he's working for a white person. He's shoe shining. And you could actually make some decent money shoe shining back then. Uh, like it, it, it's something no one, none of us think about doing. But at the time, especially for a 19 year old, that was a good job uh, relative to what black people could do, obviously, because even though there was an oil boom, a lot of the black people weren't allowed to work in those oil factories or any of that nature. So they couldn't even get a lot of that oil money, um, which, which is his own conversation. <clears throat> so the, so since he was working at a white owned establishment, this is why I pushed it so hard. They could not use the bathroom at the white owned establishments. So they had to go to another building to use the bathroom. I hate to quote this movie because I can't stand it, but I think it, um, if I can even remember the name of it, um, but I, I think it, camera help me out. I think it, uh, hidden, what is it called? Uh, hidden, um, Colors? hidden, uh, hidden figures. 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 If you if anyone's uh, ever uh, seen that movie, not a big uh, fan of it. 
Okay. Okay. But the scene does give some context. There's a scene where the uh, I think it was Taraji Henson's character mm-hmm. had to run across the the facility to use the bathroom because they had a facility only yeah, yeah. made for for black or colored people at the time. She could not go to the bathroom in her own part of the of, of this huge campus. So this brother's shoe shining white folks, and he can't just go use the bathrooms. So he has to go to another building to use the bathroom. Um, and 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 that's important um, because if he could have went somewhere else, maybe if he could just go where he wants to go, maybe this doesn't even happen. But so he goes to this building. It's the Drexel building. Um, it's 319 South Main Street. And he gets on an elevator. Um, and at the time, elevators were operated by other people. If you ever go to a basketball game or something, you still kind of see that. But generally speaking, you know, you just get on an elevator. But back then, somebody had had to operate the elevator and sit in the elevator so people could go up and down the elevator. And there's a lot of different stories about what happens right here. There's no clear, there's no clear point. There's no clear like um, definitive story of what went down. So like there's different, there's different versions. So he gets to this elevator. Some say he, the most common story is he slipped and fell and he grabs this white girl's arm, her name being Sarah Page. And she screams, she's a 17 year old girl. And then he runs away. And then he was accused of raping her. There's other stories that they were lovers, you know, and that they got into an argument. Again, none of this has been verified. Um, there are different versions of what went down. Um, and ultimately, though, the clerk says he heard a scream um, that was downstairs, and and uh, and 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 uh, Dick Rowland runs out. Um, and and obviously, if you lived in this environment, a white girl screams. You're running out. I don't even like being alone with white women to this day, you know. So I understand why during that time, you know, he, he all hell white. breaks loose when a white woman screams. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so, and of course, um, it don't matter what actually happened because what was gonna what were they gonna do? They was gonna run and say everything under the sun and all hell was about to break loose for this black man and anyone who tried to defend him. Yeah. So, that's the option you got us to get get the fuck on yeah so yeah. he was he was smart to run but i think it's interesting how some people probably be like well why did he run which is very you hear some of that bullshit today um but i think that was the smartest thing to do you know um spoiler alert you know he actually so he's like one of the few people that survives this story um <laughs> ironically but we'll, we'll get to that so the white girl screams um they they re- they reported um <clears throat> They arrest, they they eventually arrest him after the clerk talks to her. And the story gets put out there that um, a black male attempted to rape a white girl. Now, the, the next day, um, the it's published in um in the in the uh Tulsa I think it's a Tulsa world. Um the, the article, and it'll be on your screen, it's uh called Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in Elevator. So he so even if somehow the brother did it, which I, you know, I don't believe it, and it's not even really relevant. But even if he did it, he still technically should go to trial and all of that. But instead, they put out an article that says "Nab Negro for attacking girl in elevator." And there are some reports they've been able to verify it because nobody could find the articles. But there are some reports that were editorials that actually were calling for him to be lynched. Yeah. It's just no one's ever been able to verify this completely. But there are. There were people in the in the report. They said there were some folks who were saying that they just can't find because the paper that reported this is now defunct, so they can't find it to to clarify it. But there are is a chance that they actually call for a lynching, um, anyway. But this uh, this gets much worse than just one lynching, as as we'll get to. It's um, basically, rallying up the troops. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. So that was at three fifteen in the day on May thirty first. I think the mm-hmm. timeline of like how this all goes down after this is what's wild yeah. yeah it's 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 like it's like low-key scary um yeah I, you know i don't know if i'm jump, i don't know if i'm jumping ahead but like didn't she not even want to press charges she never pressed charges after it was mm-hmm. all said and done she never actually pressed charges no one's ever heard her actual side of the story we don't know even know if she said that he tried to rape her we don't there's no record of what she actually said so she she could have saw a spider screamed and exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it could have been it could have been anything, you know. Exactly. Um, but but we'll we'll never know. And and obviously they weren't interested 
and, and doing it, the climate, again, like Cameron talked about, was already calling. If we need to get rid of niggers, they're, you know, they're bringing our city down. And there's already this general sense of criminals too. But we also were seeing how history starts to link, like well, it had already started, but we're seeing another link of criminality and blackness and how that's always seen as synonymous and it's rarely separated, no matter what you're doing. Um, particularly, you know, in this case for black males, like just, there's just this harsh link for it. Um, so at four o'clock, now again, there ain't no social media, so this is fast. Like at four o'clock, um, the talk of lynching um, Dick Rowland has already grown so ubiquitous that the police and fire commissioner, um, J.M. Atkinson, a telephone sheriff, Willard McCullough, alerted him to the ever increasing talk on the street. Ain't no social media, ain't nobody tweet this shit out, ain't nobody call nobody. They just, in, in 45 minutes, they already like, hey, this shit's getting crazy. Um, by sunset, which came at 7.34 p.m. that evening, observers estimated that the crowd had grown to hundreds outside of the courtroom. Not long after this, cries of, let us have that nigger, could be heard echoing off the walls of massive stone courthouse. So Willem McCullard, he was the... Um, he was the uh, sheriff at the time, William McCuller. He had recently been sworn in. He had different ideas. He actually did a good job protecting um, protecting the brother uh, from getting lynched. Like he was like, he calls in people and he goes in there and pretty much barricades himself within the jail. He's like, I ain't gonna let this happen. But he's like, I don't believe in good cops. But if there was like a less bad cop, he's like the less bad cop. Uh, because the, like he's like the only one in the whole story that I found that did any type of like decent thing of protecting the person. But I don't even care because the nigga shouldn't have been in jail in the first place, right? Like, he shouldn't even been there. So even that doesn't get like, that. a lot of love, you know? Um, mm -hmm. he shouldn't even, it shouldn't even come to this. Uh, so, um, so, so black folks are hearing this shit too. Like this isn't just uh, white people talking and black people are just again, in this rosy utopia somewhere, just buying black, like that's not what's happening. So black people are hearing this and they're like, oh, you know, this is, this is, um, this is, this is it's wild. Like we might have to do something about this. Say what? Yeah, it's time to clack back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because again, there's already hundreds of people at 730. There's already hundreds of people outside the courthouse. So um, a uh, Will Willie Williams, a popular junior at Booker T. Washington High School, had hurried over to his family's flagship business, the Dreamland Theater, at 127 North Greenwood. Inside, he found a scene of tension and confusion. And he says to his people, we're not gonna let this happen. He declared a man who had leapt onto the altar stage um, or somebody had leapt onto the stage and said, we're not gonna let this happen. We're gonna go downtown and stop this lynching, close this place down. And like I had noted, this is already, they had already done this before. Like a group of black men had actually prevented a lynching before. So there is some confidence that they might be able to do this. Now, obviously, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen next. But um, right. so they went downtown. Um, with, they went to the courthouse armed with rifles and shotguns. Um, the men got out of their automobiles, marched to the courthouse steps. Their purpose, they announced um, that no doubt stunned the authorities, was to offer their services towards the defense of the jail, an offer that was immediately declined. Um, assured that Dick Rowland was safe, the men then returned to their automobiles and drove back to Greenwood. So they actually yeah. went to the police and was like, yo, mm -hmm. let us help. You know, because clearly I ain't calling nobody out here. So let us help, you know, <laughs> so it's like, um, but they were turned away. And then this takes it. This is this is this escalates to a whole different level after this, because the white folks are like, who are these niggers with guns? You know, mm -hmm. and like so. So it's a whole different um, it's a whole different ball game. So it says the, the visit of the black veterans had not all been foreseen. Shocked and then outraged, some members of the mob began to go home to fetch their guns. Um, others actually went across the street to the National Guard Armory and asked them for guns. That's how deep it got. So some people are going home <laughs> for guns. Some people are going to the National Guard. The National Guard did not give them guns at this time. They do later, but they didn't give them guns at this time. Um, What's the thing? Nine, you can actually go to the National Guard and ask them, hey, can we borrow you? Can we borrow these? Yeah, the fact that you can even like that you could even conceive that. <laughs> so it's just and, and, and like, yeah. And not that they gave them to him, but they still gave them to him later. Like, yeah, like they, I don't, I think they, they were, the National Guard was very little help. The police were the main ones that gave them guns, um, but we'll get to that. Um, you know, I think an important takeaway, you know, from this 
Um, the fact that these niggas fought back, like they was like, yeah, you know, that's not going down here. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was, I wonder why that part is not necessarily told when you're talking about, um, we're talking about Tulsa and Black Wall Street. Yeah, they always just make it seem like Mm -hmm. we just was at home sleep and we just let them murder folks and run away. And it was like, no, niggas have always and will always resist. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's one of the coolest. My bad. I was just going to say that was one of the one of the dopest things that um, I took away from our ancestors episode. Like. Our ancestors actually fought back. There was, like Cameron said, there was always black resistance against white supremacy. That always was there. Yeah, since the beginning of the whole struggle, mm-hmm. we've always engaged in it on some level. So whether we won or lost, we've always been there to at least try and fight and defend. We didn't just, like Cam said, we didn't just like we weren't just sleeping in our beds and you know everybody got jacked up and burned down and not. Some 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 cases that's what happened, but I don't blame right. them for that either. But I'm just saying, like, you know, there was some resistance to the fact that this went from a lynching, um, or or attempted lynching to something else, right? So so now, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a, it's a whole nother ball game. Um, it says the, um, uh, the white mob outside the court, um, at by 9:30 had swollen to nearly 2,000 people. Um, because now they, oh, niggas got guns. Okay. Like they, 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 it's, it's another level. They had blocked the sidewalks as well as the streets and it spilled over onto the front lawns of nearby homes. There were women as well as men, youngsters, as well as adults, um, curious seekers, as well as would be lynchers. A subsequent testimony, this is about the, um, police, um, subsequent testimony as recorded in handwritten notes to the post riot investigation later revealed that there were apparently only five policemen on duty by between the courthouse and the Brady Hotel, notwithstanding the lynching moment. Moreover, by 10 p.m., when the drama at the courthouse was approaching its climax, um, Gustavin was no longer at the scene. He had returned to his police. He returned to his office at police headquarters. Um, Gustavin is uh, one of the police, one of the uh, police who was over this situation, or was supposed to be, at least. Uh, so this rumor of a Negro uprising um, starts to spread. So now it's not about a nigga that that would potentially rape the white woman. Now it's about a whole Negro uprising, right? Mm-hmm. So we, this is what I'm saying. Like, we don't get this. It's just like, we just hear about somebody trying. It's like, no, nah, this escalated. And these white folks was like, okay, we're going to take it to another level. Um, so it says... Uh, real, real quick, real quick. Ahead. You bring back the, uh, the timeline again, just... Like how, is, like how that was what I just said. That was at about ten o'clock. Um, now this Negro uprising more so starts to be fueled. Um, you know, it's fueled by that first one. Um, but then the black the 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 brothers realize it's getting worse as we've noted. So they came back um, a second time. Um, and this is uh, this again represents another another level of um, of of what went down. Um, so this is a I've been to the car, small groups of, of armed African-American men um, began to make brief four ways into downtown, their guns visible and passerby. In addition to the reconnaissance, the primary intent of these trips um, was to send a clear message to white Tulsans that these men were determined to prevent by a force of arms, if necessary, the lynching of Dick Rowland. Um, but this, when they showed up this time, white folks did not, you know, they definitely didn't take Colin because now everybody's when they got their guns. They're trying to borrow guns from the uh, National Guard. Um, the police ain't even out there no more. So it's, it's on a whole different level. Just um, getting real. Yeah. And then so a World War I veteran um, who was, this is again, as the brothers have walked the sec- as they're down there the second time, um, was carrying an army issue revolver. And he says, um, nigger, the white man said, what are you um, going to do with that pistol? He said, I'm I'm going to use and the black the, the brother said I'm going to use it if I need to. Um, Period. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then the white man is like, um, no, you give it to me. And and like and then the brother's like, like, yeah, like Nigga, what? He's like, what the fuck? Yeah, like, no. the brother- <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> he said, he said, nigga, you gonna give it to me. Yeah, he said, give it to me. And the brother's like, no, like hell I will. Like, nah, bro, like I'm not giving you nothing. So 
says the white man tried to take the gun away from the veteran and his shot rang out um and a shot rang out and it says america's worst race riot began all hell um, breaks loose and later in the report it says about 20 people died within that shootout on both sides um but as we know black people are not the majority in this situation or even close yeah. mm-hmm. so it says outnumbered more than 20 to 1 the black men began to retreat in the flight towards the african-american district with armed whites in close pursuit, heavy gunfire erupted again along 4th Street, two blocks north of the courthouse. This is starting to sound like some type of movie, but this is real. Um, this is how crazy this went. And I want to show people- um, yeah, you can visualize this. People who can, who are watching this. And if you're not watching this, you can check this out on um, Black Power Media. I'm gonna just pull up the map here, just so people can um, give me a second. To kind of scroll down. Um, Again, that's Black Power Media. Yeah, this is on Black Power Media. I'm... All right, so this is the um, <clears throat> this is the courthouse, right where you see the red. This is the courthouse. Um, and so the brothers rolled up in here, and this is kind of this is this is the direction of where people are coming from. Now they have labels. We'll put some of this. Right, so blue is retreating or advancing blacks. This is actually a really good job whoever did this. Uh, so blue is is retreating blacks. Let's just go through all of this so we don't have to come back. Um, any thick red is a white mob or crowd. Any red is a white advancing or whites, white defensive or offensive lines. And then blue, so blue is black and red is, is white. Um, and then green is any, any type of police um, and that's, Pretty much it. There, are, there were airplanes involved. This is just really interesting that someone even had to map some shit like this out. It's gray as black neighborhoods. Um, this is battle. Um, and, you know, then this is police officers. So we come back down here. Um, again, if you're if you're listening to this, uh, we'll do our best to describe it. So so you're not left out of the picture. But if you want to see it, um, you can you can watch some black power media or you can just read the report yourself. It's if you just get this look this report up and go to the bottom. It's the last pages in the report. Um, so this is the this is the when a riot erupts. This is the courthouse. This is the county courthouse, and this is when it goes down. Um, and again, it has the times next to it, right? So this is at ten thirty when this happened. Um, remember, this all this all was reported at three fifteen in the day. So within about seven hours, it's already got to this point. And again, on social media, none of that, but word still spreads. You know, people find ways to get word to each other. Um, so this is the Drexel building. This is actually where the brothers slipped and fell or whatever. This is where the alleged rape could have taken place. Again, that's the court building. Um, all these red lines, these are the white folks trying to come get us. The blue lines are the black people trying to get away. Because again, they're outnumbered 20 to one. So just imagine being here and you're trying to get out. Because these first home. Yeah, these fr- this Frisco tracks up here, that's like a that's the race line as they call it. That's the color line as they call it. That's how you get to the that's how you get to you get to your place. This is all white folks territory. Um, so you're trying to get out. And for, again, for the people listening, the courthouse is at the bottom of the screen, and they're trying to go north to get across the tracks to their neighborhood. And white folks are on on both the east and west side of them as they're trying to get away, and they're outnumbered twenty to one. Um, just to give you some context. If you're just listening, and this is, might be a little difficult to just picture in your head, um, one thing that I think TV, specifically Lovecraft Country, actually gets a little bit right is their episode on Tulsa, um, because it highlights how it wasn't that Black people were just running to retreat. It was Black people were fighting back and wanted to make sure that other Black folks knew what the hell was coming their way and ran back home to let people know. And we, to go back in the timeline, when we talk about Black folks who have been driving by um, to the courthouse, Black people have been, knew that something was going to pop off. So people been had their guns ready, were been trying to tell families. And even in the midst of folks still hoping that the worst wouldn't come, people knew that something could go wrong and were preparing themselves for it. Regardless of how I feel about the show, um, if you're just trying to get a visual, yeah. If you can make it that far, uh, <laughs> then, I've never then, watched you know, it. So. Yeah, 
then you should definitely or or just skip. You know, you don't really have to watch the whole season. It's not like it's coherent anyway. But um, I, mean, <laughs> I, was, gonna, I was gonna ask about that Lovecraft Country slander. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you need a little little comedy in the midst of a massacre that we're discussing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, shortly, shortly after fighting had broken out at the courthouse, a large number of whites, many of whom had only a little while earlier been members of a would-be lynch mob gathered outside of police headquarters um there perhaps as many as 500 white men and boys were sworn um in by the police as special deputies so on the spot so they were sworn in by the police just want to like make sure people get that <laughs> like they they were sworn in by the police some were provided with badges or ribbons in their status many it appears were giving specific instructions According to Laurel um, G. Buck, a white bricklayer who was sworn in as one of these special deputies, a police officer bluntly told him, get a gun and get a nigger. That's, Please that's note, they're being sworn in because police had immunity and couldn't be put up for trial, even What's though like they would have got part? away with it anyways, even right. if they weren't a cop. But now they're emboldened right by a badge. It sounds real familiar. <laughs> Yeah, something like that about to happen re in recently here, about a couple months ago. Every day of the week. You talking about um? You talking <laughs> like about like during a protest and everything? They were talking about such such. They you know possible or uh, what? What state was it? Was talking about potentially swearing in uh, just average citizens. I can't remember what you're talking about, but I I can't remember the, the like the exact context. But I know what you're talking about. I know when um yeah, I know in Georgia. They actually just eliminated the whole citizens arrest thing um, because of that was when Ahmaud Aubrey got killed. Um, you know, Ryan's going to deal with that as far as like you know racial hunting. Um, but but yeah, there there this sense of like citizens being um, a part of like a part of the police force is that it goes back to this and even further. And I think we when we were talking um, to prep, prepping for this episode with uh, with, with uh, Dr. Rasul, we were talking about how. The Second Amendment um, was for a variety of things, but the Second Amendment was so it could arm the whole citizenry to clear out the natives, right? And to clear out any anybody who was a threat to the state because the state didn't have enough um, men, male, manpower by itself. So it had to enable the, the entire um, population to do so. And um, that's much scarier than just the police. That's why it's not good to make to kind of just mesh it all together. Because if there's just the police, that's a certain body of people. But if everybody feels like they're the police, you know, you get shit like this because there's just no level of safety. There was somebody who said they went to work and there was nobody there. I was just a white person. And the boss was like, you know, it's a nigger fight, it's a nigger fight. You ain't got to work today. That's how deep it was. Like people were at work, like, yo, you ain't got to be here. Like, yo, we, we about to go kill huh. some niggers. Like it, 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 it reached that level um wow so, yeah yeah oh so, <laughs> like a celebration or a holiday yeah, or some yeah shit like man that. like it, it it had gotten to that point man so it's like um so, so is that the only thing that'll pause capitalism what a nigger fight <laughs> yeah i mean but again the violence, nigger fight fridays the the the, 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 violence niggas. Part, the violence is part of it right <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> Take Friday off. I think this is the key point when we talk about like dismantling this myth is that it wasn't black people and black capitalism and black folks making money that pissed them off. This was about racism. This was about mm -hmm. seeing black people who were willing to to stand up and not, you know, be, oh, yes, sir, no, sir. It's like, no, niggas. Like, if y'all think that we're just going to lay down and take it every time, that's a no. And what charged up these white people was literally black people standing head shoulders high and being like, we will not let you just aimlessly keep killing us. It had nothing, not nothing, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, white people did probably were not happy at all yeah, uh, watching yeah. Greenwood be, be sufficient, if, even if it wasn't self-sufficient. But this was about power. Mm -hmm. And needing to say, like, we need to remind you niggers your place and who you are. And if you think that y'all are going to just stand up to us, then, then let us show you how we can uh, bring you back down. And, and even through this massacre, we know and we hope that by y'all listening to this, that y'all know that, yes, plenty um, 
property was destroyed, buildings were destroyed, families' lives were taken. But the the part that never gets to be truly celebrated is this notion of Black folk standing up and resisting. And so, you know, I think that's why this is so important to talk about how, like, the the folks who died, the folks who lost everything, the folks who then had to flee, um, like, that's the aspect of this that should be honored for them and not just, like, constantly talking about like, oh, they lost their businesses. Like, yes, they lost their businesses and money was taken away. But like when we talk about rebuilding Black Wall Street and shouldn't just be about some capitalistic um, narrative of a town, yeah. but also like be reminding people to be emboldened to stand up to any and all uh, facets of racism. Right, right. No, that's, that's, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's more than just a capitalistic endeavor, you know. Um, also, we, one takeaway you can get from this episode is the price you pay for black resistance as well yeah there's a price to be yeah. paid um and they paid it with their lives with blood yeah and this and is we, before the civil rights movement this yeah. is mm -hmm. 40 plus years before mm -hmm. that um and so it's also important to recognize that you know not just Tulsa because there are other areas that were resisting before this and we've talked about that in some episodes but that like black resistance has been around forever and it's not what it, it's not happening just so that way we can make money but it's so that we we can have autonomy over our lives and over our existence so this isn't the worst we're not even at the worst part of what went down yeah we're still at like a 10 we're at like 11 o'clock when shit's just now getting real. Yeah, it really gets worse the next day. Um, and that's so saying, as bad as this is, we're not even at like the worst part yet. Um, and that's the scary part. So, yeah, this is this is happening. This goes into the night. Um, and, and the idea was that, um, you know, there's skirmishes all around the city. You know, this is like after the nigger fight, nigger fight. But it, this, like we had noted earlier, this has moved on really from being about a lynching. Um, so there was a story about how um, some people were yelling, get the rope, get the nigger, and they're still at the courthouse. Um, but nobody really did anything because this, this is about the Negro uprising, as they called it. Now, this is about putting all these niggas in their place. This isn't just about lynching one person, um, you know, who they feel raped a white woman is sending a message. Like, now we're going to send a message by dealing with all these niggas directly. That's, that's the energy that they had. Um, so at approximately two in the morning, some people started to think, you know, maybe this is starting to die down. Um, the first fighting along the Frisco railroad, again, the railroad is kind of the, the, the color line that breaks the two neighborhoods up. Um, the white would be invaders still south of the tracks as well. As a result, some of the Greenwoods defenders not only concluded that they had won the fight, um, but also that the riot was over. Some of the white people thought that this was over. Now this is where things start getting murky because again, this is 2 a.m. Um, and we don't really know everything that happened overnight. Um, so around 2.30, word started to spread, and this is where a lot of rumors are getting circulated, especially from white folks, that 500 um, armed black men from Muskogee are, are on their way to arrive, and they're, you know, they're going to kill everybody. So now you got even more white folks getting ramped up, and this is just escalating and escalating and escalating. Um, and so word's getting out about this. Say what? I said, this is rumors and hearsay that is yeah. wrapping them up. And it's at night. I'm sure nobody's sleeping. I'm sure everybody is drinking. I think it's, it's noted in the report that a lot of people are liquored up at this point, obviously. So, you know, and, and we know white people and liquor is always a bad outcome anyway. So, uh, you know, so it's like um, about around 5 a.m. Um, this is where I'm going to come back to the map because I think that this is actually um, important to just kind of give people some context um, as far as what we're down. So it's it's 5 a.m. Now this is where for me, but I'll just give you know before I even get into the exactly everything that went down. This this whole scenario was weird. So if you're watching it, um, you see these this red, and if you're not watching this, if you're listening. So that now they're surrounding the black neighborhood of Greenwood. And there are people on the west side posted up. There are people on the south side and there are people coming um, from the east side too. And this is at 5 a.m., 5.08 specifically. Um, it says that several witnesses later recalled 
An unusual wh whistle or siren sound and perhaps is a signal for mass assault to Greenwood to begin. Although the source of this whistle or siren is still unknown, moments later the white mob made their move while the machine gun in grain elevator opened fire. Crowds of armed whites poured across the Frisco tracks headed straight for the African-American commercial district. Um, as Mary Parrish, she was one of the survivors of it, said Tuesday night, May 31st was a riot. Wednesday morning by daybreak was the invasion. So somewhere between two and five, this is coordinated. There was a fucking whistle. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's just a, there was a whistle or an alarm or some sound to be like, go. This sounds like, this is like what you do in war. And they're mm -hmm. posted on all the outposts so they're not just coming from one area, they're coming from different spots. And at this point, it's gotten to like thousands of uh, of thousands of people. So they go in and says so the first thing they started, armed whites broke into black homes and businesses, forcing out occupants into the streets where they were led away at gunpoint to one of the growing numbers of internment camps. So even though some people weren't killed, they were put in camps. They were taken from their homes and put in camps. Where like they were is, beaten and threatened. Yeah harassed i think one story that was so sad was it talks about how you know after the night one of all the madness um this older couple is going to bed you know they're just like finally things have calmed down my neighbors feel like they can go to sleep we gonna go to sleep and it, they talk about how white people bust in their house shoot them in the back of their head and then light their entire house on fire and these are like 80 year old people, I believe. 80 year old people. Like these people's nanas. Yeah, yeah. Like this, this is how this is how deep it gets. So uh, so yeah, that one. Um it says it says um moreover, African American men to kind of to Cameron's story, like African American men in homes were with firearms were discovered, met the same fate. So they were they were um killed if they found that they had guns. Um, even if they did, even if they had no intention of using them, um, it says next the whites looted the homes and businesses, pocketing small items and hauling away large items either on floor or by car or truck. So they didn't just burn the homes; they stole people's shit um, for themselves. Um, and then finally, riders then set the homes and other buildings on fire using torches, oil-soaked rags, house by house, block by block. The wall of flame crept northward, engulfing the city's black neighborhood. Um, and then we talked about the internment camps um, where they had people literally posted up, um, you know, and, and this is, a, there was like different camps around the city. So this isn't just like one camp, there was different camps. And there's even a story where some people, they would take them out and if they would have them walk with their hands up and they would shoot at the ground um, and, and, and to make people walk faster. And if they did anything, they might get shot. This is why I was saying at the beginning, it's very possible that way more people died than what we know. And that's why there are these mass graves that have not yet been fully accounted for. So the numbers probably are higher than 300. Um, you know, I, again, I think around 200 or so black folks died. So honestly, you know, for the fact that it was that the disparity was what it was, the fact that we took out, I mean, white people was kind of honorable in a way, but, um, <laughs> but so there were still people fighting back. So, you know, there was a uh, story of his brother named uh, Peg, Peg uh, Leg Dick Taylor, a uh, legendary black defender who said to have single-handedly fought off more than a dozen white riders along the northern face Sunset Hill. <laughs> the white guards and posted there found themselves at least for a white, uh, excuse me, found themselves at least for a while under attack. And he, he was said to have taken out several of those people and he survived. So eventually the National the Guard Lee. shows up. So yeah, eventually the National Guard shows up, but everything is pretty much bad at this point, because as you see, um, this is the firewall, and this is where there was a whole battle taking place, and you see all the blue again is black, is black people running away, and the green is either the police or the troops, and the red is the white people fighting. Um, so this all pops off at 5 a.m. the second day, uh, 5.08, and the, the um, troops or the state National Guard doesn't show up till around 1130, I think, or something of that nature. Um, and there are some stories that they did, they, they, they helped clean it up. Then there are other stories that they actually had breakfast first, um, depending on, you know, who, who what, what narrative you take. Um, 
So the fact that some of them might have had breakfast first is uh, pretty terrible. So now there's also reports of planes that were um, that were some people say they were dropping bombs. Some some people have been able to verify whether that was they were capable of that at the time. But it is that it is known that there were planes and that people were shooting that white folks were shooting from planes um, and that there was, you know, and then a lot of black people just got out of town. Like they literally just left if they could. And, there, and there's also stories about some of the surrounding towns being hostile to them, even trying to leave. Um, but a lot of black people got out of town. Others were arrested. And, you know, the, 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 the local National Guard, mostly what they did is they went around. They just they were arresting people and taking them to camps themselves or the police was doing it. And their claim was that they were protecting by taking them to camps where they uh, were getting their asses beat and harassed yeah. a brother who had a he had stub legs. Um, and he, one stub was bigger than the other or longer than the other, I should say. And he, um, you know, he, he used to do, I, I didn't say all this, but he used to do like tricks and stuff on the street to, just to make money. Cause obviously it's hard to get a job if you have that type of disability. Um, and this is within Greenwood. And then, you know, as the massacre is occurring on the second day, they, um, uh, some, some of the white vigilantes, they, they, uh, they took his, they took his bigger stub and tied it to the back of a truck and, and drove around the city as his face is, you know, pouncing into the ground. I'm just like, this is the type of like just vicious shit that went down. You know, just one example of many. I mean, there's another story of um, somebody ran into a theater, um, a white theater trying to trying to escape. Um, and, and it was a, obviously a black person and he gets on stage and they they see him and they shoot him on stage, you know. Right, like right in the middle of it. I mean, it's, it, yeah, there's, there's countless stories and I mean, we'll never know all of them. All in all, um, you know, about 1.5 million in damages was done um, relative to 1921. If you adjust for inflation, that's about $20 million. Um, I don't even think that begins to give us enough um, of what, what, is, what is owed. Um, you know, most of the business were just businesses were destroyed. We talked about the homes were destroyed. Um, and there was actually, I don't think I put it in the notes, but they actually um, tried to pass an ordinance saying that um, that they weren't a, some type of fire ordinance saying that black people weren't going to be able to rebuild their homes. It was it, this had to actually go to the Oklahoma Supreme Court to deem this law unconstitutional. Um, so they didn't even want them to rebuild originally. Um, or they really never did. Um, all in all, um, this is from the report. It says uh, Gong was the dreamland of the Dixie. Gong was the Tulsa Star and the Black Public Library. Gong was the library cafe and the Elliott Hooker's clothing store. Um, H.L. Breyer's cleaners, Mabel Little's beauty salon. Gong was literal lifetimes of sweat and hard work and hard won rungs in the ladder of the so-called American dream. I, I said so-called. Um, Gone to were hundreds of homes, more than a dozen African American churches, all torched by white, by white um, invaders. Invaders, nearly ten thousand Tulsans, practically the entire black community was now homeless. So even though he said earlier they didn't have, most of them didn't have the greatest homes. They did have somewhere to live. Most of them didn't have anywhere to live. So you think about a lot of these homes probably got burned. There was even not, wasn't even nobody in there because people were just trying to get out of town. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much what happened. Um, you know, post that, there was a suppression of this story or this this history um, for for decades. And there was even even white folks who tried to write about it. Their job was threatened. Um, they, you know, teachers who tried to talk about it in their class fought hell for this. Um, and you know, some of the survivors kept it alive. And the commission report, even though I think it has its own holes in it as well. It's probably the best documentation of what went down. I would be weary of some of these other sources because people just be repeating shit and they don't actually check where they got the stuff from. Um, but yeah, as we see, and it's kind of reiterate the point that violence is essential to capitalism. It's not a separate element. So it's not a matter of they were living rosy and then white people got mad and interrupted it. This is what happens. This is how racial capitalism functions. Like it, it, it requires violence to keep it going. This land that we know as America wouldn't exist without violence. Nothing, you know, we, we see what's happening in Palestine. That wouldn't, Israel wouldn't exist 
without violence. Like this is this is this is the function of it. Like violence, like I think like Dr. Ball says, the first job is military conquest and everything else is public policy. But you have to put people down and then you have to have the threat of violence uh, to, to always being always being in the air, understanding what could happen to you. I think it's also important that like understanding the ways in which this works, because if we are going to be able to learn from things like this to be able to prepare ourselves for whatever may come in the future, um, we need to know how the enemy works. We need to know mm -hmm. and learn from history so that way we don't end up um, being subjected to, be, to it repeating. And we know that aspects of history will always repeat itself. So we, if we know how folks have moved in the past and we can prepare ourselves for how this will look in today's society, because it won't look the same, it will look worse. Yeah, and that's why I think when we, um, when we offer the context at the beginning to, um, to Tulsa, um, you know, and we think about everything that went down um, it's it's important to understand like that time period for what it is and stop trying to extract um, whatever happened then to today. Like, I think that's one of my biggest pet peeves about how a lot of the social justice talk today is people that act like time was always existed the exact same way. Um, and, and, and people have related the exact same way because, well, racism has always been here or you know, sexism and so, and it's like, yeah, but they uh, operate in different forms depending and they, and it adjusts mm -hmm. to the time that it's in, even exactly. like that's how it's most effective. So it doesn't make as much sense to do certain things you did in 1921 that you did, that you would do a hundred years later. That's just, even if you take racism out of, that's just in general, it just, it's a different time. Like we were talking, we were just joking, but like there wasn't no social media, you know what I mean? Like there wasn't no, wasn't no television. You know, they were talking about theaters. Well, people went to watch theaters. The people went to theaters, not like how we go to theaters, like where we just go to see a big movie. Like that's how you watch shit back then. You just went to the theater. You know, yeah. that's why shit could be playing all day. You just went there. Like we can't even conceive that. I'm just using that as a as a kind of like a non, you know, aggressive example. But I'm just saying like, we have to be able to contextualize how things went down. And it's like, there's no way coming back to the myth that that Black Wall Street could have been self-sustaining in the period that violent. Like, it doesn't even make, like, they're not going to let it happen. <laughs> so it's like, and again, I don't even know self-sustaining, if you take the real definition of it, is actually the greatest idea anyway, because, like, you, you're limited to a lot of, you're limited to a lot of things. You're not trading with anybody. You're just living within your own space, and you're not sharing with anyone else. I don't even know if that's the greatest idea, but it, whether, that's another discussion. But I'm just saying there's no way that you could live under that level of violence you have this many people being lynched. I don't know if I said it earlier or not, but you had like 75 people that were lynched within that time period around the country. Um, you know, no, within just within just 1919, I believe 75 people were lynched, you know, so it's like you're living under that level of violence and you think that somehow you're able to just be like, oh, man, we're just going to go have a black Wakanda in the middle of that. Like, right. <laughs> and they were always under threat. And yeah. so it's like, yes, they may have had their storefronts, but who actually was owning them? Who were we? Were people paying rent to each other? Uh, were people having to pay rent to white folks? What? Where? Where were they? Where was every single thing being grown in Tulsa? If you've ever been to Tulsa, you know that's not happening um, <laughs> at all. So you're still having to outsource things, and I think that it is. And I said this earlier. It is a beautiful thing to celebrate all that they were able to do. And Tulsa is a huge city. It's and Greenwood is a neighborhood. And I think that's something we left out when we talk about like what Black Wall Street. It wasn't the entire city of Tulsa. It was a particular community within it. That's not to take away from the impact that they were being that they were able to make. I think if anything, that's something to celebrate even more so is that a singular community was able to have 121, I think is the exact 191 um, mm -hmm. businesses of their own. You know, they were able to, and that's also a condition of the time when segregation is taking place across the country. There are black communities who had no choice. You don't, you didn't have an option but to go to a mm -hmm. black dentist, but to go to a black doctor a black right. cleaners, a black bakery to go to, to host your events in a black location. And what's significant about Greenwood was that not only were they able to do this, but they were able to be more uh, financially sustainable. 
And sometimes self, self-sustainability sh- shouldn't even be the goal, as Black said earlier, you know, you're always going to want to be able to interact and to trade and to support across. And so if Greenwood had just been self-sustainable, that also meant that they wouldn't have been um, supporting Black communities outside of their community within Tulsa, within Oklahoma, in other places. It would have that would have limited them. They would have been the, the bad side to Wakanda where they just let everybody <laughs> else die and they have their own shit, right? So, 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 you know, I'm, just, so I'm just saying, like, even if even if right. that was a, a thing that I don't, I actually don't think a Wakanda is a thing to aspire to, but that's a, that's another conversation. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm just and saying, not like, everybody was rich in Greenwood, right. unfortunately, and that's a, and that's not to throw shade at any of our ancestors uh, there, but it's to bring context into it. While there was a lot of um, black business within it, not all of them were flourishing and wealthy as it's commonly discussed not everybody was living mm-hmm. the lap of luxury there were quite a large bit of folks who were living in what we would consider a shack um who were living 90, in fancy homes yeah. and to go off of what you said yeah and, go, yeah. and, and just go off of what cameron said learning the reality of the situation is um is way more impressive than coming up with a, a fictionalized fantasy version of uh, Black Wall Street, it's more. It's, it's just so much more impressive than the fact that they were able to do this um, to that level, and even fight back and resist. Yeah, it's like what we have been able to build. We are willing to protect with everything in us. You exactly, know? and that's something to be honored. And like, as we tell this story and as we aim to dismantle this myth, it is not to do so in a way that like throws shade on. Uh, on Greenwood and be like, oh, Black Wall Street didn't exist. Niggas wasn't as rich as y'all made them seem. They weren't yeah. out here pretending uh, um, to it's be not building. done maliciously. You're right. Yeah. Um, but it's it's to actually bring more integrity to the story mm-hmm. and remind folks of the ways in which Black folks within a um, segregated, racist city um, and state and country at the time Black folks were able to carve out something for self. And the actual massacre itself um, was due to a lot of the pride and the strength that Black folks had because of that to be willing to have such a small but tight-knit community to where if something, if something, someone, the Klan, anyone was to stand against a community member, that they weren't going to just let that happen. Mm-hmm. And it was, right. and they were willing to put their businesses, their homes, their lives on the line exactly. in order to pre- protect community, not to protect capitalism. They didn't give a, not that they didn't give a fuck, but they weren't sitting here going um, and being in front of the courthouse thinking like, oh God, I got to protect my business. I got to protect my assets, my money. They were like, no, I need to protect a community member, a family member, a friend, a brother, a cousin, and be willing to take whatever was going to come with that. I think the research on this is, is, is I don't want to say it's bad, um, but I think there's a lot more research to be done um, because the report is like the only thing that gives you some, con- I won't say the only thing, it's one of the few documents that give you some concrete evidence of like really what occurred. Um, and yeah. it's not really trying to push any type of like hopeful story. It's just like, yo, this is just what happened. Yeah, it's, it's real. And like, I just, I hope, and I think I say this all the time in our episodes that like when y'all listen to this or see this, that it just, pushes you to actually just go and look more shit up on your own because that it's not even the brunt of what happens. And I think a part of honoring them is to truly know what um, these folks went through and understand that it's not just something that has happened in one place. You know, our last episode um, was on how, you know, Flint is an anomaly. It's not just a one-time thing. It wasn't something that has just happened in one place that Um, This has happened throughout history, and it is still not something to be forgotten, and it should be honest. Yeah, we hope y'all learned a lot. We went through, we we felt like it was necessary to go through the violence. It's it's the 100-year anniversary. There's going to be plenty of people that talk about all the businesses that existed. I guarantee you very rarely will anybody discuss how many people were not business owners and how many people were poor. we're going to just, so we were able to go over that. I hope y'all learned something. Um, in the next episode, we're going to discuss more. So how this, this story has been, you know, 
appropriated for more modern um, agendas. And we're going to discuss that with um, with Dr. Ball. Um, so thank you, everybody, for listening. All the sources will be listed. Um, mm -hmm. And again, one more point. We were not, we just want to keep saying this, we are not shitting on the people of that time. We know our words have been taken out of context sometimes. Um, you know, we're used to that, but we're that's not what we're doing. So I just want to make sure we clarify that. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Peace out. Uh, okay. Fresh out the plane in a whole nother state. I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate. Seems like my homies were stuck in the hood. I just told them be safe in the state.